Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Palmer, uh, and welcome to the App Exchange for Government, Innovation, and Public Sector. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to our App Exchange, uh, and then we're uh, delighted to have two guests here with us today that are going to share their customer stories. Before we begin, it would not be a Salesforce presentation without the safe harbor. So uh, just uh, once again, uh, please make all buying decisions based on what is currently available. Our two guests today are Gilbert Sabad and Dan Alt. Uh, both have uh, been working with many of our partners as well as Salesforce for quite some time. And uh, we'll get into their presentations in just a moment. So our app exchange. Uh, we like to consider it um, very, uh, very close to the Apple App Store, except for business applications. And so it's an ecosystem of proven business apps that are pre-integrated to Salesforce technology. So this is important because of all of the different um, tools and uh, technology that we provide to them, which allow the partners to uh, deliver faster and more innovative applications to the customers. So there are really three main things that we look at when we talk to our partners, when we talk to our customers, and we talk about the things that are important to them. First, built on trusted and um, uh, leading edge technology. So they're able to build their applications faster. We also help them grow with Salesforce. So we provide training, tools, resources, and events to help them work with their customers to provide that latest and greatest technology. We also help engage with other partners on the App Exchange so you can find the right tools and the right applications when you need them. So we also provide apps across all departments. Today we're fortunate to have both Dan and Gilbert here to talk through how they went through and have uh, been in the process of implementing or have implemented uh, our applications and our partners' applications across their departments. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gilbert. Thank you, Dan. So quick introduction on uh, Region Appeal. I'm the Commissioner of Service Innovation, Information and Technology. The Region Appeal is about 1.4 million residents and it's one of the fastest growing region in, uh, in Canada. We have about 330,000 households and about 100,000 businesses. In terms of the services that we provide to the region, they're very diverse varying from public health, such as long-term care and paramedic services, all the way to water and wastewater and human services. So from a different perspectives of these services, their definition of systems or ERP, whichever term you want to use, is very different. So the challenge that we faced as a region was we traditionally took the approach of using monolithic ERP systems or monolithic systems and ended up with 1,900 different systems and about 30,000 databases. That's the challenge that we were faced with. And as you can imagine, that's not a, an environment that you can sustain and you could keep moving forward, especially trying to keep them up to date, upgrading them, and trying to integrate the different systems. So we had to take a different approach to address that. So we started going down the path of what Gartner would refer to as postmodern ERP. In our context, it was more postmodern systems because it went across ERP, CRM, EAM, it went across the gambit. And what it is basically in a nutshell, it's the same capabilities and functionalities that you get in a monolithic ERP, except that it's componentized and it's delivered on, a on, on the same common technological platform with the same data architecture. The benefits, as you can see on, on the page, I'm not gonna read them out, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits from that approach. So when we went out looking for the appropriate solution for that platform that gave us that common technological capability and that common data architecture, the solution obviously boiled up to the surface was Salesforce. Here's a breakdown of what one of those programs looks like. And this is a breakdown for, uh, for housing. And what it allows us to do is we looked at the business processes at a very high level from end to end. So this is affordable housing. 
and this is shelters also for emergencies. And for those of you who have walked around this wonderful city of San Francisco, you would have noticed that, especially at night, in corners, homeless people sleeping. This is one of the examples of what a, what a solution can address, can address that type of problem, as well as people looking for affordable housing. So we looked at the whole spectrum of what we refer to as tenant management, as well as structure management, because we have to maintain those buildings as well. And we mapped the appropriate technology to those needs. And as you can see, there's different technologies there, but Salesforce is predominant there, as well as App Exchange partners. And this is key. This is what our postmodern system for that particular program looks like. And it is a combination of primarily Salesforce applications and Salesforce App Exchange partners. Our journey to postmodern systems, Dan referred to that we've been at this for a while. The reality is we piloted Salesforce at the end of 2014 and have been implementing different components of Salesforce since January. But we've gone in those eight, nine month period that we've been implementing Salesforce, we have done quite a bit and are planning to do a lot in the next 14 months expectations and beauty about about this platform and the app exchange partners is that it gives us the ability to very rapidly and in parallel deploy multiple solutions this is an example of what we're taking on in parallel we talked about housing the housing solution has a 12 month time span and I can compare it to existing other government initiatives that have taken place in the province of Ontario. And I can tell you we're delivering in a fraction of the time and probably it, with a budget of about one to 2% of what they have spent, the equivalent functionality and complexity they have done with other different uh, platforms. We also have diversity of functionality so we can address housing from a human services perspective while at the same time addressing waste management for public works as well as addressing connections to water systems for public works and handling child subsidy programs for human services. And the benefit of all of that is you have a common user experience, standardized and integrated reporting and analytics the common data architecture and the same technological architecture, meaning that you don't have to train hundreds of different people in different uh, technologies. Here's an example of a result of a program that we deployed. I jokingly say that it took us more time to acquire the solution than it took us to implement it. We actually turned around and implemented it in less than six weeks. The results, however, can, sp can speak for themselves. We were planning a 50% digital channel uptake. I set that out as a uh, big, hairy, audacious goal to the team. And they came in actually with a 91% digital uptake. That's only 9% of the people who actually called the call center to consume that service. And they weren't forced to consume that service, and yet we had 83% of the 300,000 eligible households in the region appeal that actually consume the service. The benefits, which came in the, in the form of cost avoidance, were close to $2 million. Not a bad ROI for the region and for the, one of the most important services for people, garbage handling, this was a huge result for us. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. So um, we're going to transition now to Dan Alt. Uh, Dan's going to walk us through um, the, the city of Elgin's customer story. Before we do, uh, his team put together a quick video, and we're going to start with that, and then we'll jump right into uh, to his section. Well, one Elgin is a mindset or a philosophy about seeing things differently, thinking differently. Instead of thinking from department to department, we have a police department, we have a fire department, we have a public works department. It was about thinking of the city of Elgin first, and a department second. Even if departments wanted to work together collaboratively, they would often have to overcome the city's software systems, communication systems, or lack of communication systems to overcome that. Now with such tools such as Chatter, 
um, certainly text messaging, email, mobile devices, social media, we're much more able to easily collaborate in a way that would fulfill the goals of One Elgin. I think the technology solutions we've deployed embody One Elgin because they're all operate on the same platform. They make use of the latest technology, so it operates just like any web page would operate or anything else you find on the internet or on your smartphone today. We have the uh, Salesforce and Force.com applications tying all of the Force.com together to use of Chatter. The new version of Salesforce allows data entry through the Chatter application, which makes it so much easier for mobile employees to keep their documents updated, as well as keeping all the other staff up to date on what's happening around town. Using Chatter removes the siloed approach that we had before Salesforce. We currently now have the ability to interact with departments uh, throughout the city with much more ease. We post it to one centralized location, which is Chatter, and that allows many departments to get in on the action. So once it goes on to Chatter, um, members from City Hall, from the Police Department, from Public Works, from Engineering, all have the ability to access that information. And with that, we come up with uh, some good solution to a lot of problems that we face. In order for the different shifts to be able to keep apprised of what's going on within the operations, we post things in Chatter. And then it's incumbent upon the people that are off shift to be able to review what's going on. It's a really useful tool to communicate with people at their convenience. The sky's the limit with what we can do and what we can use it for. I think the Force.com platform is, is the most exciting thing that the city's done uh, in the 16 years I've been here. It's, it's truly an innovative processing environment. And I have right now one of my help desk techs is being trained to become a, a Force.com developer. And, and we're gonna, we're, we're recreating IT within the city of Elgin as well. And we're gonna, we're gonna see some progress, I think, in the next year with city-created apps. In the last year, we focused on continuing to develop Salesforce for the 3 and one center, um, expanding on what we've built in Chatter and in the Service Cloud Council, which everyone uses every day. We've also worked on continuing to develop uh, water billing solution, code enforcement solution, parcel management, and work order and asset management. This year is we'll finally be able to launch our community portal. And so that's the front end piece of Salesforce and we really haven't been able to show that off yet, but there's a lot of exciting things I think that are gonna come with that. With all of the new things that we're doing, whether it's you know with Chatter or with GIS or with all the technology strides that we're making with our public safety, all of those tools are wonderful, but we also need to remember all the people that are behind them to actually take the most advantage of those tools that we have at our disposal. So I think that you know the more that we can invest in our employees and the more that we can focus on organizational development and the more that we can then talk about um, you know how all of this relates back to our strategic plan in one LJ the better off we're going to be. Great. And now, Dan Alt. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. So um, I wanted to show that video just because I think it helps kind of have people understand what our organization's like, that we really do use um, Chatter and Salesforce. And just a little bit of background on the video before I get going here real quick. Um, it wasn't meant to be a commercial for Salesforce. That's kind of what it turned into, so that's why I brought it here. But uh, what it really was is just an internal kind of employee engagement piece to kind of get people fired up for this year, keep them informed on what we're doing. Um, it's just kind of a change management strategy that we deployed. So we had a lot of fun making it and um, figured it'd be a good thing to show here. So to start off here, just a little bit more about the city of Elgin. We're just outside of Chicago. Um, you know, we're about 110,000 people. We're one of the fastest growing um, suburbs in Chicagoland. I think we led in housing starts um, two or three years in a row now. Um, we have a little over 300 employees that are on Salesforce, use Salesforce. Um, so that means either they're using that as like their um, work solution or it's like police officers that are logging into Salesforce One and posting or a part of a chatter group. Um, and then you'll see on the, the other side of the screen, areas of focus. So what this kind of is, is this highlights the areas that we, this is the reason why we had to invest in the public sector app exchange. So in local government, you have really these three areas are really what you can boil everything down to. So you have constituents, which are businesses, citizens, and the community. Um, you have assets that you maintain, so think infrastructure, all those sorts of things. And then you have locations, so addresses, parcels. Those are really the three arenas that cities live in. And so when we looked at um, upgrading our technology systems as part of the One Elgin Initiative and kind of trying to reinvest um, in, in, and eliminate the legacy systems that we had, this is really what we focused on. And what we're trying to do is what 
I don't think has been done in any city in the country, and that is create one truth in each one of these areas. So what I mean by that is, I mean, everyone is tracking addresses and locations, but every department has their own version of what is going on at that address or, lo or location. So code enforcement has a different system than police, um, different system than fire, different system than public works, different system than the city manager's office, um, different system than community development. Um, and so you can imagine why that's problematic. Um, same thing with assets. Um, even within the public works department, there used to be multiple systems that were used, and that's not uncommon in cities. And then, of course, constituents, which I think is, is maybe the most important, and that's why the Salesforce CRM uh, made so much sense, is that every department in each one of these areas also kind of has their own version of citizens and businesses. So even if employees wanted to perform at the highest level possible, they don't have the information they need to do their job because they don't know that you made that 301 request when you're at the permit counter and vice versa. They don't know that you have a water bill coming due. Um, they, you know, all those types of things that are really important, same thing for police and fire. They don't, you know, they don't even have a chance to know that. Um, so really kind of merging these areas, what we're attempting to do in the single platform. Uh, this is a quote I've used several times. I used it in a city council presentation to try and kind of make the point of what we're doing. And I think what most of us understand is that technology is growing exponentially and has been for some time. But if I walked through City Hall, particularly a year ago, I'd watch people come in on their iPhones. And then they go to the permit counter and they're filling out paperwork. And it's, just, it's just insane. And the systems that our permit team was using, it's, it was part of our legacy ERP. I mean, it's late 80s, early 90s technology. Just stop and think about that. So there's a couple of things, and a couple of reasons on why it's problematic. Number one, it's just old and outdated. Number two, if you're going in, at least this is what I would think, I would have a lot less confidence in those people being able to get the job done if they're using a paper system and this old green screen type system versus something that's more modern versus having a web presence that's a lot more like Amazon.com versus you know kind of this clunky, weird login type situation that you typically see in cities. Um, Along those lines, too, I like how the quote ends, um, because I believe technology, from a technology perspective, there's no reason local government can't run like Amazon.com. And again, what I mean by that is one login. So you don't have a separate login for permits. You don't have a separate login for 301 requests. Um, if you want to pay your water bill, you can do it just like you can with any other company. But it's one single space. Um, and so to kind of help us close that gap, we have a lot more app exchange installations in our org than this, but these are really the big four that help us achieve what I was talking about in that Venn diagram earlier. So BasicGov um, really specializes in parcel management and everything that happens at an address. So that's code enforcement, that's permits, that's licenses, that's planning and zoning, um, and on and on and on. Um, we've also worked with them to sync our GIS system with Salesforce. So we're just now getting going with that, and that's really exciting. Again, getting to that one truth. Um, Anexa is the billing uh, piece, piece of that. So a big focus for us since the beginning was water billing. And the reason being is that's just a huge choke point, because every location has a water bill. Somebody's paying it. So that's one way to kind of make sure that you have the best information, at least about a location, is that you, you have a captive audience paying water bills. So we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, Asset Optics is the work order and asset management system that we've been using. It's just been phenomenal, especially um, the work that they've done in the chatter action space is, is awesome. Um, I mentioned the GIS integration once. We now can use Salesforce One to locate infrastructure, get the lat long just with the push of a chatter action. Um, public works and other areas are able to check into work orders, so we know when they're working on it. We know when they're completing it. And for them in the field, it's super easy because they're just using these actions. They're not you know, typing all kinds of complex things. They just hit a button, and then for the most part, just hit save. It records what they're doing. So that's been a, a great partnership. And then Fontiva as well, which we're really excited about. Uh, Fontiva has actually built a platform on the Salesforce platform. And really what we're going to be able to take advantage of, I believe, with them is their community piece. So this fall, we're going to be leveraging what they've built to help us launch the standard Salesforce community. And we believe with them, they gave us the best chance to really um, provide that Amazon.com experience for all those items I mentioned. Um, there's all kinds of, of good things we're going to pilot there, um, creating sub-communities, and then slowly kind of even roll out the chatter feed to the public for certain specific things. So what I mean by that is if you have a rental license, maybe there's a rental license group where landlords can collaborate, where police officers that are in a crime-free housing unit can help answer questions and post documents, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then, you know, what I just wanted to do, um, I'll get through the slides real quick, but then just kind of show you real quick in our org what this looks like, because it's a real live, living, breathing thing, and that's something I just have felt coming to Dreamforce a couple of years, you just don't see enough, it's just, let's just see it. So, um, there's just a couple areas I'll go through, and if there's questions, I can go to other areas, but I just want to show you, this is, this is what it looks like to run a city on Salesforce, is kind of what I just want to be able to show. So, um, we are live. Uh, in Central Standard Time, it's after five, so the bulk of the work, with the exception of 911 and some other areas, is calming down, but as you saw, I just hit refresh and something new popped up, so I don't know for sure what someone's gonna post, that's half the fun here, um, but I can show, you, can show you a few things, so hopefully, I didn't tell anyone that I was doing it live, hopefully no one plays a prank on me back there. Uh, but it's possible, it's possible. So what you're seeing here first is a code enforcement case, and this is a code inspector who is posting a picture using the chatter feed of um, an issue that's going on at this property. This next one is a 311 request. Um, and you see here that uh, our advocates are responding. Um, here, there's just more collaboration on, on a request. You'll see a ton of at mentions. And I just love that in our organization, an at mention means something, and it's not Twitter. Everyone, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the city, what your age is, everyone knows what an at mention is from the janitors to the city manager. Um, so here you see that we've got um, at mentions and then also we are tagging with topics. Um, you're seeing uh, knowledge base articles updated and you'll see again that um, that's our 311 supervisor. She at mentioned 311 because in that group is anyone who's really related to 311 so they can consume that information. Um, and so just a few more here, you can see again, more code cases apparently are coming through. This is a permit that got approved um, and some other pictures. So we could go through that for a long time, but I just wanted to kind of show that, you know, this is real, this is, this is you know, what's happening. Um, the way I liken it to is I liken it to, and this works in public safety, I, I just say it's a radio frequency. That's all it is. There's different channels. This is just another way to communicate. Um, so I have some more bookmarks here that I just wanted to show that you know, there's all kinds of, of different things that are happening. So this is one from this morning where there was a water main break on a busy street. Um, and you can see it is posted in chatter, it's tagged. And then from there, Molly, who's one of our social media pe uh, people, was able to post it on social media, get the word out, and then we actually pushed out a push notification to our mobile app. So <coughs> essentially what's happening is information that used to be scarce, you know, you either had to be an executive or you work in that department to know what's going on, is now plentiful, it's everywhere. Now everyone can access that information, it's not just restricted to where you work. Um, real quickly here, I just wanted to show what our address database looks like. I have a lot of things that are collapsed here because it's just not as important to me, it's in other areas. Uh, but you can see this is a, a real address um, in the city of Elgin, it's actually a city employees here. And you can see some of the information that we're pulling in, there's a lot more than this that's part of it, it's just not all displayed. This is uh, what we're billing them, right here, this, this utility information. This is the contact that's associated with it. So an important piece is assets, contacts, and locations, they need to be synced together. So it's not just a static name that's associated with an address, it's an act the actual standard Salesforce contact associated. And that's how we're able to maintain that one single source of truth. Um, just a few other things here. Again, there's a, a 301 request associated, and then here also a water meter that's at the property. So again, assets, contacts, locations. Um, then just kind of real quickly moving along, I wanted to show, and you also see there's actually a code uh, complaint at this property as well, um, is our work orders. And so here's one I wanted to pull up. I can get the details here on it. Um, it's a utility cut, which basically what those come down to is um, sidewalk repairs, anytime we have to cut the street, basically is what it is to make a fix. Um, and you'll notice, I can show you here, are the chatter actions that can be used. So to edit it, this is all you have to do. And this is the standard, you know, things that they would do to complete the work order. So on a mobile device, it works the same way, um, but basically just saves them a lot of time. If they want to complete it, all they have to do is hit update, it automatically puts the date in. Um, and then there's stages, so there's sawing, then excavating, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of those can be completed just with the click of a button. So I just want to show that. Um, one other thing here, this is a, actually a, a work order that is for, I believe, a turn on. And so another you know, situation where you use chatter actions, this allows the service tech to enter a water meter reading right there. So we actually have a little 
workflow here. So if they have to do a manual um, entry, this makes it real easy and almost idiot proof. Um, and then if I need to reassign it to someone else, and then you can see it just walks us right through here um, in the chatter feed. So um, all kinds of other things I could continue to show here. Um, we pretty much are trying to use chatter to the largest extent that we can. Um, but you know, you can see the trending topics here that are on um, today. So um, with that, that's kind of that's kind of it in a nutshell. And I'm happy to to go to you know other areas of the org if you have questions on that. But otherwise, that essentially concludes my part of the presentation. So, oh, actually, no, yeah, forgot one more slide. Forgot. Thanks, Rob. So last one um, that I wanted to show, and I'm glad I didn't forget was Nucleus, um, actually I think it was their first uh, ROI case study that they've done for a city was us earlier this year. And so you can see here, they looked at our use of the service cloud and of the app exchange installations that we had this spring. So we are continuing to roll more and more out. But at that point they took a look at it and they saw the return on investment at 120% and the payback of the project was 0.7 years, average annual benefit just a little over half a million dollars, which obviously was good affirmation for our city council and we're, we're thrilled that they were able to, uh, to do the study and um, obviously the results were what we were hoping them to be. So that I believe, yes, concludes my part of the presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. So at this point, we'd like to make it uh, much more interactive. And so uh, I'll kick it off with a question. But uh, if anyone has any questions that would like to ask, just let me know. I can walk around with a microphone, and we'll make sure we get those answered. If there's more you want to see as part of the demonstration, we can do that as well. Um, so Gilbert, I'll start with you. Uh, so, so what is next? What, what is coming up next with everything you've been working on? Um, what's down the road? Quite a bit down the road as we can. Uh as some of the team members over here can attest, we're uh, taking on everything from human services, housing, uh, childcare subsidies. We're uh, beginning down the path of uh, sunsetting our ERP system and replacing it with a uh, you know Salesforce App Exchange uh, partner that will uh, that will provide the uh, your typical GL APAR. There's uh, enterprise asset management uh, down, down the road as well. A lot of parallel initiatives that can be run in parallel because of, as I, as I had mentioned earlier, that common technology and that common data architecture. Dan? Uh, yeah, yeah, for us, I kind of alluded to it already. The biggest probably piece is the community portal piece. Um, once we, you know, and the water billing component with that, we've been doing testing now for a couple months because that's something we just, uh, we can't screw up water billing. Um, so. That along with, it has to be Amazon.com. If it doesn't look and feel like Amazon, we're not gonna roll it out. We're gonna continue to work until it looks um, and feels that way. So along those lines, for us, that's I guess immediately what's next. But besides that, I mean, we're looking at our organization as a technology company. So every quarter, we meet with city council, we meet with staff, and we're gonna be releasing something. So along those lines, really what's next is building an in-house development team so we can continue to do more and more of this innovation um, there is no, there is no go live. There is no, hey, we're implemented. It's a living, breathing thing where, as employees see things that need to improve, we need to be able to be responsive. That's that's the benefit of the platform. So, okay. Right. Gilbert, back to you for a second. So, uh, lessons learned. Is there anything now that you wish you'd known 18, 20, 24 months ago? If I was around in the region 18, 24 <laughs> months uh, month ago, I wouldn't uh, probably have allowed the uh, selection of a water billing system that we had talked about earlier. It would have been done on the uh, Salesforce platform. I would have started a lot earlier. Yeah? Um, for me, I guess it goes along the same lines. My last answer, I would have worked harder, lobbied harder to start getting an in-house development team earlier probably. Um, but besides that, kind of a funny story. when we. Um, first, were, when I was presenting to the city council on purchasing Salesforce, um, right prior to the meeting, the city manager and myself and the three-in-one director were talking about staffing. And we made the worst decision of all time. We said, we don't need additional staff. We're going to keep bodies in there. And the city council didn't even ask us to do that. So I have no idea why we did that, but that probably was our biggest regret that we had. I mean, they, they don't even remember that we said it, but we remember in house. So that was um, the other biggest regret is that we you know, didn't really look at the fact that, oh, well, we could hire developers and do all these other things. So th that's the only real thing I would have done differently. Great. All right, with that, any questions? Have you, 
have you seen any kind of a make sure it's on? You good. Have you seen any kind of financial return on investment from this transformation? I know in the government, city, federal, state, ROI is generally not measured in financial terms. It's all about the benefits to the citizens. So I'm just kind of curious, in your experience, and it's a relatively small city, so you're able to move things very quickly. Have you seen, have you actually saved any money, or will you at some point? Um, I, yes, I believe so. I mean, the nucleus study alluded to that. Most of those are soft cost or uh, positions that weren't filled. So we have seen certainly return on investment, and I believe we'll continue to see more and more on that the, you know, as we get the community portal rolled out. But you're right, that was not the, the overarching driving factor. The overarching driving factor was updating technology, giving employees the tools they need to do their jobs, and that by itself provides better service to citizens, and ultimately, you know, it saves extra phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. It provides return on investment. Gilbert, any thoughts? Uh, We've definitely seen a return on investment into, in different formats, in the format of, uh, of cost avoidance, but we've also replaced our own existing legacy CRM system that had taken years to implement, and I won't mention how much to implement, but we basically, within a period of less than three months, we basically replaced the system that took years and multiple millions of dollars to implement. Uh, in terms of, I think that you know, it's just to uh, just to echo, what you definitely see is an improvement in the service. So it's really not about cost savings, and even when you do have cost savings, it's about taking that in, that those cost savings and reinvesting them, because today residents are are expecting more from their uh, from their governments, more value and more services. Great. Any other questions? Back here. I think in the City of Elgin slide, you said you had 300 internal users, and I think you said that you had 25 external oh, users. Is that right? I was curious about yeah. which groups you've tried to work with and yeah. how, how you found that, how that goes. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry about that. I actually missed, forgot to touch on that, and I was going to show that in the demonstration as well. I still can. Um, those are, you know, not generally speaking like uh, customers, even though that's what the Salesforce little thing there says. They're um, contractors primarily. So waste management picks up our garbage. Guess what? We have a chatter group for waste management. Their employees are in there. The school district, the library, that we have them in our storm command groups. So anytime there's a severe weather or snow and ice, because we're in Chicago, every snowstorm, everyone in those agencies gets the inside baseball on what we're doing in snow and ice operations. So they're in there. Um, construction projects are still going on now. So the engineers that we hire to be out in the field, they're posting in Salesforce One what's happening. Um, and if 311 says, hey, we got a call, there's something goofy, one of the construction vehicles is going on someone's yard or something like that, they can then at mention them in the group. And um, you know, right away from there, then that engineer can, in a few seconds, resolve the issue. So that's what we mean by the external users. And there's 25 that are truly active right now in different chatter groups. Great, there's another question. Um, in the Elgin example, what do you attribute your success with Chatter to? That seems like it's tough. Ado adoption yeah. can be really tough. Um, disappointing people at a rate they can absorb. So <laughs> it's a funny way to say it. But so what I mean by that is you just have to you have to look at taking wins and kind of letting it spread on its own. So for me, I spent a lot of time in public works. So the first thing I did is we bought Salesforce, wasn't configured, wasn't up and running, and I thought, you know what? Let's try it for snow and ice. So I just created logins for police officers, public works superintendents, the city manager, and you know a handful of people that were fire, um, that were involved in, in snow and ice. And instead of a million emails going to half the right people, half the wrong people, um, hey, forgot to put you on the list, um, you know, all those types of things, we just started posting what's happening, posting pictures. And the other huge benefit of that is that helped our outreach on social media as well, because the social media people are in there now. And now they're seeing the real pictures on the street, they're getting shots from drivers, they're, you know, real live updates can, you know, things happen much more rapidly. So we started with that, and we actually got a lot of good um, publicity, both locally and then also actually from Salesforce too, we weren't even live. Um, so that was great. And then kind of what happened from there is we slowly just started finding more and more of those use cases and just slowly adding users. So we didn't push it on people. What started happening is people started asking, hey, you know, can I get a group? 
can Parks and Rec get a group? You know, can we see what it is? So it just kind of spread on its own. And then over time, you know, with, through the app exchange um, implementations, you know, their, their regular work systems now are just part of Chatter. So everyone kind of got used to it, first just in regular Salesforce and like groups. And then from there, now it's just part of what they do every day. Great. Any other questions? Uh, one thing I didn't quite hear from uh, either of the panelists was if you built this in-house or if you had a group of uh, contractors come in to do the work for you, and if there was any decision that went into that or uh, thought that went into that decision. Uh, for us, it's a combination. Uh, we have the, built some things in-house, uh, and a lot of the configurations, you know, I do and some other people do in-house in terms of changing layouts and that sort of thing, add many stuff. Um, but besides that, it's, it's a combination because the App Exchange partners are really the ones that have done the bulk of the developer developer work for us, um, and you know they haven't you know made too big of a use of third parties. The original three and one implementation, we also did leverage Unisys as a partner, um, but the platforms changed so much that actually a lot of that initial work we've already kind of rolled over just because of new releases. So. Um, it, for us, it was kind of a hybrid and still is a hybrid. We do stuff in-house, but we also leverage app exchange partners. For us in the region, uh, we, took, we did not delegate the role of service manager, so all of the architectural work, whether it's the enterprise architecture or the solution architecture that was in the security, that's the work and the data architecture, that's the work that we did. The actual development or the implementation of solutions was delegated to partners. Now one of the key things that we have is, as a mandate in the region is whatever we put in has to be standard, no customization. Nothing should stand in the way of any upgrades. So everything that we're doing is basically off the shelf. Great. We had a question over here. Hi, um, uh, with respect to the uh, chatter usage, that you spoke about multiple uh, chatter platforms or the groups being created, and you also talk about, an in, I mean, the problem that we face is that, you know, if you send an email to multiple people and then they don't respond. Yeah. Uh, also, like, in, in a chat, chatter platform, if you put a kind of a case, and how do you pin the responsibility of a person to act on? Because it's multiple people looking into it, uh, who's going to act on a case, and there are multiple departments would be involved in, in you know, solving the issue. Sure. That's, that's a great question. So we still, you know, use queues, assignment rules, and all those sorts of things to manage cases. And at mention, and believe me, it's an internal discussion all the time because every department's kind of different. Some want at mention, some don't. Um, and at mention is, is more of a call to action. So this is a unique case. It's going to your queue, but again, I pulled up the customer information, and so and so is called X Y Z amount of times, or they had their water shut off and they made the payment. Um, but there's some other unique circumstances. I, one that comes to mind is they had like an in-home daycare. They just forgot to pay their bill and it was a really large bill and so we shut them off. Um, that's where at mentions come into play. So that still goes to their work queue, uh, but this is just like an additional call to action. Um, in this, the regular feed, if it's not a case, you can see probably when I showed it that people are at mentioning me with different questions or I'm at mentioning someone else just kind of giving them a heads up about something. So that's how we manage that. All right, I think we've run out of time. So thank you all very much for attending. Uh, thanks both to Gilbert and for Dan for coming to share their stories today. If you have any questions, uh, my contact information will be on the front slide of that presentation, which we will post. Thanks so much.